I'm Chase Raz, and this is the Zillica Observer. In this episode, we'll hear from Tony Curranduke from UFF Sports, which is a fantasy sports operation being brought onto the blockchain and powered by Zillica. This episode is going to really wow you because of the vision that Tony, his team with UFF Sports, and their developers at Zillica have regarding this project. Never in a million years would I have thought I'd be excited to see fantasy sports get a DEX and liquidity pools and crypto tokens, but when you hear the vision, not just the operational vision, but the larger vision about transforming scouting, taking fantasy sports full time for some, and empowering people with crypto and financial literacy through sports. Yeah, I said you'd be wowed. Stay tuned, we start in under 10 seconds. Hi, everybody. With me today is Tony Karanduke from UFF Sports. But, you know, we do see this stylized some places, UFFS or Ultimate Franchise Fantasy Sports, which is what it stands for. So, hi, Tony. How are you today? Very good. Very good. Happy to be here. Well, thanks for being here. I, I do appreciate it. And I'm excited to have you on the show today because it seems like there's a lot of excitement around UFFS. Do you prefer to go by UFFS or UFF Sports? What What's the preferred branding of your business? Yeah, UFFS is what we uh, usually go by. Yeah, you guys. All right, great. So I, I think there's all of this excitement and we want to dig in. Of course, everybody who watches the, the podcast knows or listens to the podcast knows there is sort of a formulaic flow. And I want to jump right in because it was one of your business partners that introduced us. This is the first time we're speaking. And so it was Dave. Dave reached out to me and, and said, hey, can I get you in touch with Tony? So Tony, tell me a little bit about yourself because you do have me at a disadvantage here that, that you know, we've, we've never had the privilege of meeting. Yeah, for sure. Um, grew up in, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, worked in the, the agricultural field for the most part. Um, got into crypto about uh, five-ish years ago, um, just investing in, in uh, the ups and downs. And had the idea of building a NFT project about two years ago. Got together with uh, nine other founders. and uh, Nine other founders? Yeah, yeah. So we raised we raised a bunch of money to uh, to, to build the platform, mm -hmm. and um, we've kind of kind of grown from there. So we're everything that's built to date has been totally privately funded. We our whole platform has been built with our own money. We started out on Ethereum, and luckily enough, we decided to switch gears to Zillica <laughs> because we'd be having a real hard time right now with uh, NFTs on Ethereum, um, just with the transfer costs and the cost to actually create one nft is just almost wouldn't work right so um, we switched gears over to uh zillica about a year and a half ago and um it's kind of they built everything from there so that's good. how i got into this project <clears throat> okay so let's let, let me let me focus in on this nine business partners so you're one of nine um are all nine still active today Yes, absolutely. Yep. yep. Wow. So what, how does that structure work for you folks? Um, I, I can imagine that the board meetings, the Zoom calls might be a little bit chaotic or how, how's, how, how is the structure there? Help me understand that a little bit. Um, actually, things go fairly smoothly. We're all kind of at, uh, got the same mindset, uh, the same goals. Um, we work together pretty well, actually, to, considering there's 10 of us. Um, I think it goes very well. Okay. Well, I, I'm I'm thinking because the the largest um the largest business I've been a part of directly was um where where we had that many owners was seven and I remember our board meetings were sometimes they were very efficient and other times it was well that's been a yeah. nice four hour nothing um, so <laughs> I, I I imagine you understand that very well um Tony yeah. take me back in time though you mentioned an agricultural background so. Um, what what part of that that industry in the actual production or the supply chain or what what part of that world did you come from? Uh, a bit of both. So I started in production, um, uh, ran a, a family farm, a grain farm, and then moved into the hog industry. So I worked in the 
genetic side of the hog industry for many years. And then I uh, moved over and started uh, selling feed for every species. And then with, with another partner, I, we started our own uh, livestock consulting business. Oh, that's really good. I, that, that, that's really cool. Um, Ran that yeah. for, for five years. Um, and just recently, about a year ago now, we sold that. And I am now into crypto full time. Full time into crypto. Good. That was my next question. I, I was going to say, you know, I, I'm sure you've done or maybe not. You know, I, I, I don't know. Florida is not the epicenter of agriculture, but uh, I wonder if you've ever done anything with hogs or cows down here where I'm at in Florida. Uh, not Florida specifically. Um, some companies that would cover Florida. I, yeah, I've been to trade shows in Atlanta and worked with different suppliers it's such a it's such a big and impressive industry that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. I'm I'm woefully ignorant of, and I have some yeah. friends who work in it, and they pick on me, and they're like, you know, they they joke, they're like, you don't understand the first thing about what we do, and I have to admit, I really don't. Um, and yeah, yes. and that's the, that's the fault of the agriculture industry, to be frank. We just didn't don't do a good job of educating people, and I don't know if that's on purpose or why, but we just we don't so. Well, that's a shame. And and can you confirm something for me then? I had one of these these friends of mine, his friend, no, we're not business partners. We've just known each other for a very long time. And he told me that in the industry, of, especially when it comes to livestock, that a lot of these companies are being bought up by construction companies to intentionally show losses. Is that is that actually, I mean, is my friend pulling my leg or is that actually a thing that happens? Um, yeah. On the beef side, I would say that does happen. Um, a lot of uh, companies buy into feedlots because they're very, very small margins. So, mm. other than that, uh, the other species, it's, it's, it, it's, I don't know. It might be a little bit different in the U.S., but in Canada, it, that would only happen on the feedlot side. Now, is your entire team based out of Canada, or are you North American or geographically distributed across the entire world? Our founders are all from Canada, so actually all from the same province. Um, they live in different prov provinces, but they're originally from Saskatchewan. But there's four of the founders have now moved to Costa Rica, and that's where I am right now. And we're working on this full time down here. So. I, I was going to ask because there was a cold front that went through North America the past two days, and I'm looking out of, <laughs> out of the background and I'm thinking, uh, hmm, you look like you, you look like you're warmer there than I am here in Florida. So. So For that's sure. good. Definitely yeah. a, a, a global team in a way. What was the, or what was that moment though? You're in your industry, you have your career, you're going to these trade shows, you're in multiple parts of, of your industry. What then introduces you to crypto, to blockchain technology? What's that first introduction? What does it look like? How I got into crypto was I was a big gold and silver guy. I kind of figured out that there's something seriously wrong with the, uh, the economy and the whole money system as a whole. So uh, really invested in silver a lot and uh, stumbled onto Bitcoin. You know, a lot of the guys I followed was, you know, Bitcoin's not real. It's not going to be around. So I kept investing in silver. And then I realized one day that it's the opposite. So you realize that the silver market is completely controlled. Well, that's exactly. And I wasn't making any gains. And I mean, I was saving my, you know, I was saving money by having silver. It's tangible. Right. Well, that was all great. But I do love, I I love silver, right? I have no, I'm not going to go down that path right now, but, but, um, I'm, when it comes to silver, gold, platinum, those type, uh, silver is definitely a, a beast I like to watch. It's, it's not a big, I, I never had a lot of success with it in terms of doing anything but storing value. I hope right. you did, but, but um, yeah, that's interesting to hear that your onboarding was from really from metals and then moving into crypto. What was, what was the moment that made you think, all right, I hear all of this advice that cryptocurrencies aren't where it's at, that it should be in metals, that we've got to, you know, get into gold and silver supply again. What made you change from that? Because I imagine, I imagine if you, you know, silver guy, that the, the pressures, some of the peer pressures to stay in, in tangible metals must have been present. So what, what was your moment of diversion from the pack, so to speak? I think I was just always keeping an eye on it. And understanding how complex the tech is and that it's not just for a currency it's for so many other things and it's applicable to every industry that i 
just started looking into it more, right? And then once you realize that it's not about Bitcoin, it's about uh, blockchain, that kind of changes your my view. And I just saw it as it, I wasn't scared to invest in it because really you can't start going backwards because it's really it's the future and there's no there's no way around it. So, so where it, I'm gonna I'm gonna make an assumption. You tell me if I'm wrong. At some point, you you know you're looking at Bitcoin. You're probably buying into Bitcoin. Um, haven't at that point, I don't, I'm, you know, not trying to get your financial information now, but probably hadn't divested out of metals. Even if you are now again, don't, don't, re don't reveal that. Uh, but I would imagine that, uh, Ethereum kind of popped into the, the framework at some point, because it seems like you're talking about, it's about the blockchain. It's about more than the store of value. It's about the utility there. So am I right in saying that Ethereum then pulled you to some degree, from bitcoin or augmented or was it a different blockchain initially uh no it would have been ethereum um just because of uh the smart contracts right once i understood what those were um that would put, would have been my next investment after uh after bitcoin and then uh really diverse a, a lot into a lot of coins which wasn't the smart idea at the time <laughs> you know i invested in everything that you can find but <clears throat> if, if i ask what year that was would you share well, yeah, 2016. Okay, sure. that's, I knew I was going to hear a 2016 or 2017 when 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 uh, you hear why I invested in a bunch of coins and that wasn't the smartest thing in hindsight. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody could have predicted what was going on back then. But at what part, or rather in what year then, if we know 2016 is where that's about where you are and you're tracking with the, the crypto market, I would I would suspect at that time, when did this genesis of nine, nine people, uh, is it nine total or 10 total? Including it's 10 you? total, yeah. 10 total, including you. When did this genesis of 10 people come together and say, let's start, let's use Ethereum, let's start doing something in the sports space? Um, it would have been the summer of 2019 is when we started uh, building, building the team. Um, and probably only half of us, we're crypto people. The the other half were sports people. Um, that's good. I mean, that's good to hear. Yeah, yeah. And we really bought brought those that half into the crypto side now, and now they're all about it. But uh, yeah, it was about half and half. We were half crypto guys, half sports guys. So, so twenty nineteen, and then where was the introduction to Zilliqa? How did that happen? Did they approach you? Did you approach them? Were you and, and furthermore, right, to kind of tack on to that, to get a bit of understanding about it, was what, whichever way the communication went, was it related to price or was it related to speed or, or were you shopping around for networks just looking at, you know, your, your, your standard unattainable triangle of service, price, and quality? Yeah, um, we had some issues with our developers on Ethereum. Things were going too slow. Things weren't right where we wanted them to be so we were thinking of making a change to a different developer and then we thought at the time let's let's check out all our options um and we reached out to zilla could just to have a chat and uh they brought us on board board pretty quickly they were able to do nfts and they're super guys to work with it, it, it was the, the opposite of what, what we had and uh, it seemed pretty natural once we got to meet them so they, you, did you have any expectation of going with Zilliqa or did that meeting transform into, well, I guess that just happened. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> we get, you know, I like hearing that because it, it actually makes me think of an, uh, an old story from, I, I would imagine the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s out in California, where Walt Disney, after he switched over from entertainment to um all the theme park and that type of stuff he would he had this technique of doing that he would invite people to tour the theme park after 55 when it opened and these are you know former military guys these are business people he would invite them for tours and then he'd show them backstage and go and there's your desk i mean that was his onboarding for them they had no idea they they weren't interested in a job they weren't he would basically do that of hey thanks for coming for the tour here's your office and, and here's what we need for you this is what we're offering a salary so um zillica kind of in a way did that to your team except in instead of employment it's in terms of application development right right yeah. and you know 
one of the important things um, when we switched is we actually get to talk to the, the big shots in the, in the project, right? The, the, their head developers are building our project. And if we, if we were on Ethereum, I mean, we're not going to get a meeting with Vitalik at any time. So it's, <laughs> it's, we're growing together too, which is cool. I, I don't know. He seems like a good guy. He'd meet with you. He's just not going to have his best people developing for you yeah. because, <laughs> um, right. but no, that, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm upon your leg there. So walk me through UFFS. Um, for those who may not know, or for those who haven't been following it or other follow uh, or follow other spaces, I really would love to hear it from you um, somewhere between the elevator pitch and the long form pitch. So I think the short form of what we're doing is we're basically taking the entire sports world in every country and every sport at every level. And we're just putting that onto the blockchain almost identically as close as we can to, you know, in a fantasy world. So um for example, we started with hockey. We literally registered every pro hockey player that's active and uh, created franchises, right? So there's there's one league that's playing fantasy hockey, um, and we don't duplicate anything. Really, the other part is what we are is a registry of all the people that have ever played a sport that we can get data on, that there's actually um, stats from what, what they've done, right, across the entire world. With this tokenization of current players, of franchises, what then happens with them? What are we what are we doing with them? Because I know that um, I know that UFFS is big into NFTs, but one thing that we talked about very briefly before recording was that there's utility built into this tokenization of the players and the and the franchises and and the different it maybe even the different leagues and i'm i'm personally a little unclear so i think if you could walk me through understanding how your nfts maybe differ than the larger collectibles that are out on the market um i know i'd appreciate that and i i hope everyone else would as well as well yeah so we create an nft of a player just like um, other projects do but we take that nft and it's put into an ecosystem so this is an entire ecosystem that runs just the way the sports world runs so when we started, it was going to be very simple. We created NFTs for franchises and players. Um, and then we play a fantasy season, just like, like you do in any sport, right? Um, and then the, the idea was the revenue would come from transactions and guys would uh, pay an entry fee every, each year. And then that's how the franchises uh, would, would grow their worth, right? But it's really evolved where we have, if you, if you look at what we have on our website, there's a whole array of revenue streams into those NFTs. Um, things like right now, we're actually building DeFi and uh, a whole DeFi system and a lottery system and a betting system that will, will draw a lot of revenue into those NFTs. Another part of what we're doing is, is, is scouting. So no fa fantasy league has anything close to what we have with scouting. So what scouting is, is you register prospects. Um, at a certain age, you register the pros prospect as an NFT, and then you hold that NFT and wherever that NFT plays in that sport, in that league, you'll get revenue from that NFT. But when that, if that NFT, that player happens to make the big league, like the NHL, for example, in hockey, then you sell that NFT to a franchise because those franchises need those players to, to play, uh, to succeed in the game, right? So then there's a profit margin for those scouts that, that find players early on and then, then sell them if they make pro. Another part of that is uh, the, the whole ecosystem is when a player retires and is no longer playing that sport, you still own that NFT. Um, and then what we're building is that NFT, if it's a star player, Will, will be valuable because we're going to set up legends leagues. So if there's, there, for example, there's 31 franchises in the NHL right now, like the pro league, we'll create a legends league with 31 franchises. And then those player, those NFTs that are retired will, will be sold to those teams and we'll do a simulated season, a simulated playoffs. Um, and that technology already exists. So we're going to piggyback off that. And then, then your NFT has value forever. Walk me through some of that. Um, what is the particular value of 
you know, bringing all of these assets to the blockchain, tokenizing them, players, franchises, every even entire leagues, as opposed to the more traditional fantasy league style. What's the real, you know, cutting innovation here? Because I, you've definitely alluded to it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, not hearing you in that sense that there's lifetime value to the NFTs. It's not just here's our season. Let's go ahead and, and do this one season of, of fantasy. Pick your favorite sport. But what are what else? What are, what are some of the other high level benefits of moving this type of um, really moving this type of gaming to the blockchain? I think what's really different is the guys that own teams now and are, are scouts or participating, they really, it feels like they actually own, the, like it's a real world uh, uh, franchise, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gathering the, like in hockey, for example, we're gathering the 31 most elite fantasy players. And that was, that is part of the goal to be the place to, to, to play fantasy sports. And a lot of the franchises are, are not just one person. They have an actual management group. So there's, there's, there might be an owner, there's, there's a GM on every team, there's a marketing person, there's, you know, it's a growing all the time. And that, as the prize pool gets bigger and as the, uh, the teams have more value, it will literally be a staff of people running it. So um, it gives that feel of being an owner or being a real, real world GM. Um, GMs already in this first season have got fired and rehired and so it's it's really like the real world and i i honestly see in the future that literally somebody will gming one of these teams will be their actual job because i think the money will be there and yeah that's what we're creating the way the sports looks in the real world we're just creating it in a fantasy play um, i find that absolutely astounding and i have to admit that i don't know how much of my absolute exuberance over that idea of what you just said. I don't know how much of it is because I'm woefully ignorant of how traditional fantasy, fantasy sports operate anyway, and how much of it is because I really do believe what you just said is profound, very profound, in terms of where blockchain technology is maybe – for some in certain industries, only a, you know, a, a minor evolutionary technology. Whereas, you know, for something like finance, it's very, it's very revolutionary. It can modify the entire system. I don't think that somebody would have put fantasy leagues at the very top of here's what the blockchain is going to modify. And so the vision of you and your, that you and your team have is first of all commendable, but then to be talking about that where people will for full-time be managing leagues this gets us into all sorts of areas where the future is coming such as um you know modeling um uh, based on your your player stats and based on your uh, all of those types of factors but also potentials for merging with virtual reality augmented reality mixed reality those types of fields i'm sure they're in the back of your mind would you be okay if we took a little bit of a detour here and maybe i'm just indulging myself but a little bit of a detour to unpack more of that vision you have for the future of this, where people full time, this is what they do, because I, I very much believe in that future with you. Well, I think in just traditional fantasy, you, you sit down with your buddies, you get together, you, you form a league, um, everybody picks their teams, you play the season, and at the end of the season, somebody wins. Right. Um, in this, there's actually something happening the entire year guys are guys are um looking for prospects they're making deals we have a we have a drafts we have um things happening making trades like because it's so high stakes it, it's in their mind they're they're on our telegram chat every day guaranteed every day they're looking at it so there's a lot of back and forth happening just as it would in the real world and that's what we're doing different basically what a uh NHL franchise does all year round is what these guys are doing. So it, it gives that real feeling. And there's a, there's a lot to do, to be honest. So these tokenized, I keep calling them assets, but a lot of them are, are individuals. Uh, these tokenized assets, they're significantly valuable because of their uniqueness and because of their ability to alter what can you walk me behind, uh, walk me through some of the engine of what determines the outcome of a match? Well, so 
like in hockey, you're gaining points every night that teams are playing because you have players spread spread across different real world teams. Right. But, um, so you collect points every night, and then there's standings between all the all the different franchises, right? So um, it's 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 in hockey, it's really intense because there's games going on every day all season. Whereas right. in football, it's just Sunday and you know a game on Monday, so it's a little less intense, but it's a lot higher stakes, to be honest. Right. Um, and so, so you see, dis- do you see decoupling the season and being able to keep this going persistently all year? Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things uh, that will be attached to it too. So these fantasy franchises, like they're doing a lot of marketing. We have a merchandise store for these fran- franchises. So they have the brand, they have their jerseys built, they have, you know, everything that a real world team would have, they're mm-hmm. doing. And, um, what about the off season? You talked about um, even being able to model, right? To take these teams and model potential outcomes that aren't necessarily being based on on real world. Is is that something that's being explored currently or in the future? Of saying, here's all of our tokens, their players, the team. They have these particular stats. We're going to run them through a simulation and essentially and effectively run a virtual game of of these two teams. Yeah. Well. That is something that we're looking at, like doing tournaments and doing head-to-head things on the off-season where it's it's a way to uh, create hype and um, um, revenue and, and those types of things. The, the actual simulation part is really, we off the start, we're going to focus on the Legends League because I think that, that that's going to be a big uh, influx of money from there because it's kind of a more of not the collectible side, but people are going to buy those... Uh, those retired players uh, as bragging rights, right? Uh, like right. I own the only Wayne Gretzky that there is on the blockchain. And that, I, you know, like that's what's happening with some of these NFTs. Like at, what Top Shot is doing is it's, it's just bragging rights that you have it. But I think we're combining that with actual gameplay where you, there'll be money to be made, right? And strategy as well, yeah. right? Because you're building those teams, you're trading. And in the legend side, I mean, new people retire you bring them into the, the legends league and, and it's interesting as well as like who makes makes it into those legends league uh, you know so i think there's a lot of simulation on that side to start with yeah and i just wanted to be i wanted to make sure that i was directly picking up on that from you and you had mentioned that with the the, the legends league prior but i wasn't sure if that was translating to so it seems like you know it's not necessarily a priority right now to virtually stretch the season throughout the year, but but something like that um, is is a possibility in the future. Yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. It's certainly something that's on our list. To, to, to sure, I, did. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't projecting that. Um, yep. So then, what sports? Um, hockey, right now, I know that's that's the one we've been talking about so far. Everybody wants their favorite sport, and they want their yep. favorite player, and they want their favorite team. How are you triaging that list? And, and do you have a particular order where people know, all right, once basketball happens, I know lacrosse is next. Like, do you, do you have that order? We don't. We're going to next. We've already announced hockey and golf. So golf mm-hmm. is going to begin uh, in August is the franchise auction. And then before the token launch, before May 1st, we're mm-hmm. going to announce four more. Okay, so it's it's coming. And let's talk about that token launch for a moment. I think this is something that people really want to know about um, as they get to know the project more, as they get to know you and your your co-founders more. Uh, you have token sales coming up. Can you walk me through some of the logistics of of how those are working? And I'm of and I, I'm going to be completely transparent here. My particular interest is because you're primarily a North Amer- you're you're a North American team, and we <laughs> we typically in not just the United States, but sometimes even in Canada, we are intentionally overlooked in a lot of circumstances because people don't want to comply with North American, the majority of North American regulations. Um, I'm very interested. So walk me through what the tokenization process is in this token sale. Um, So we're going to mint a hundred million coins, score tokens, SCO. That's, that's how many coins we have. Um, 20 million of them are going to be up for sale starting May 1st in a private sale for 10 cents each. That's the private sale price. If we sell 10 million tokens, 
and the private sale will offer another 2.5 million tokens at 15 cents. And if those get sold out, then we will move on to the public sale uh, June 1st at 20 cents a token. At 20 cents a token. So May 1st is going to be that that private sale, 10 cent. Once half essentially of that, right? You've got 100 million tokens, 20% are going to be available, 20 million. Once half of that is met, the next two and a half million are going to be at 15 cent. Correct. Yep. And then um, the remainder after that, the seven and a half mil. Um, <laughs> did I do my math right? Yeah, yeah you're I right. Think so. yep. I think so. Um, I'm going to leave that part in too, because I, I will find it hilarious when I'm in the editing room. Like I just glitched on, on simple math in real time. Well, good. I'm absolutely excited. The, so 20% are for, for um, the sale. Uh, do you have the, the particular information on the other 80% um, in terms of what is the part reserved for operations? What's the part, you know, for, I, I would imagine that you, you probably have to have a larger percentage than normal then then I guess what we would expect is normal because you have 10 co-founders. Is that factoring into the uh, the allocations any? Uh, yeah, so 20% of the of the rest of the tokens or 20% of the tokens are founders tokens. So that's uh, I don't, that's not that abnormal. So yeah. in a way, you you <laughs> you're you're almost being very generous to the to the market, to the community and saying, you know, we're not going to take much more than a standard percentage that any team would take, whether we're three people or 15. Yeah, yeah. So um, and part of that is 50 percent of the tokens are set aside for DeFi and staking. So that's going to be a huge part of what we're doing. And I, I think it's a huge draw. And it is a massive project if you look at what we're doing as we spread worldwide. Yeah. So we feel that that's very important to have, to introduce the DeFi and the staking. And then 10% is for development and, and, and consulting. And, and that, that, that's, that's what it is. Well, everything's so. pretty good there. I mean, it all sounds like fairly, fairly good. It is, it is, you do have a larger than I would say average, larger than average uh, uh, amount for liquidity. But I, I think that goes to the nature of the token. Could you give me a little bit of insight about um, the SEO? Um, I, I believe because that's score token, right? We're calling it a score token with SEO. Um, what are some of the dynamics of that token? Right. So for somebody going and buying it, that token, if I'm understanding, is being awarded for winning of a match, right? For winning of a, a for, of a game. Or what are some of the dynamics behind the token? So the score token is the, the utility token for the entire platform. Um, that's how you will buy NFTs. That's how you will trade NFTs. Um, everything in game will be score token to start. Mm -hmm. um, and as we build our decks, build our uh, DeFi portion, we're going to introduce tokens that are sports specific. So for example, hockey is going to have a token called pucks, which will be used for a, a whole bunch of things within that sport um and then what will happen as we move to the other sports there'll be a there'll be a token for those sports and then we'll have an exchange right on our platform where you can trade the different sport tokens back and forth you know for speculation or if you want to you know you're you got a team in hockey and you got a team in football you, you know you switch them back and forth and then you'll be able to stake score token for score token but you'll also be able to stake your score token for the sport tokens of your choice. So if you're playing, if you have a hockey franchise, for example, you would want to have score, stake it, and then be getting pucks so that you can do transactions and and okay. uh, and work within the, the, the ecosystem of that sport. And when I say that sport, it's for any hockey league that we develop across the entire world, any hockey uh, prospects that are uh, are going back and forth would also you know use that token as well so the the purchasing purchasing of the score token will be available on the uffs site right it, it, you, so somebody brand new onboarding they're not going to have to necessarily you know for those of us in the zilliqa world yeah we have we have our tokens and we're going to want to buy some score token but for somebody who really just wants to get onboarded to play, are they going to be able to go to your service and go direct or will there still need to be a uh, fiat to crypto gateway outside of the platform and then move in? 
Yeah. The only way that you can buy score token is with Zillica. Okay. Zills. So we'll be on Zill Swap. You'll take your, you'll go on to Zill Swap and swap them for SEO and then put it into the platform. To and then put it into the purchase. platform. But everything else there is very much a, a destination endpoint, right? Will, will you be staking uh, the score token on UFFS and, you know, the staking of, you, did you say the other sports will be staked as well? You will stake SEO right on our uh, on our site. So we're building that right on our platform. And yeah, you'll be able to stake um, like liquidity pools. You'll, you'll be able to stake pucks and score token. And it sounds like a really right interesting model for, for tokenization and, and the economics of fantasy sports, because um, I would imagine that the SEO you'll have to be able to choose what your staking reward is rather than just yes. dedicated, right? You yeah. know, you've got Zill, you're going to get Gzill. Um, I, I, I think that's a really innovative model. Are, are you familiar with something else that that does that? Was that a completely original idea well, between your team and Zillica or inspired somewhere? In our long-term plan, that the DeFi part was not even, it wasn't on our roadmap. But with right. the recent uh, developments in DeFi, we we stopped for a second and we said, okay, what what should be our priority right now? And it just makes a lot of sense. I mean, if people are going to go on to, Goose Finance or uh, Sushi Swap and 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 buy sushi. I mean, I think they can identify to hockey or their sport a lot uh, closer, yeah. and will want to participate in that within a platform that's also got, has utility. So uh, I think it's an important tool for for what we're doing. And what you said is very important. Um, but like I said, I'm woefully ignorant on how fantasy sports itself works. But what you said there is very eye opening to me. Because when you talk about seeing what DeFi is doing, somebody outside in the business world, which is, you know, right, think back to your, your former industry, when you're at the conferences, when you're at the trade shows, when you're doing B2B sales, somebody out in that world might even look over to sports, something most of us do, right? We either watch, we play something. Most of us do. We'd look over there and go, in what world, right, would you need a financial exchange? But the way you just described it is very eye-opening to me in the sense that Someone like those business people, someone like investors could go in and have financial opportunity to be earning off real utility of people enjoying fantasy leagues, whereas before that wasn't accessible. There was no utility or value exchange with the larger market. And so I don't, I don't want to lead this anywhere, but is, is that part of the, is there, uh, you know, any type of plan to um, focus on anything like you know, you have a big pool for liquidity, but is there anything to focus on liquidity providers or stakers or that aren't necessarily playing the fantasy side of it? And I think you make a very good point. And that's one of the reasons that we did push to do it so early is that now we can bring in people that don't have anything to do with sports that aren't interested in sports. There's a reason for them to come on our platform. And once, once they see how it operates, because these NFTs that, that we're creating, the players, the franchises, they're actually, they are assets and they can just invest in them. Like you can buy a, a sports team and just hire out your staff. You don't have to know anything about it. And I, we see that happening. There's, there's people talking <laughs> well, about investing where they'll just buy the franchise on speculation and let and hire the best people you can run it. But, uh, and, and that's how it is in the real world, right? There's some owners that know nothing, not, or not a lot about the sport that, that they own, but they just own it because they have a yeah. lot of money, right? Um, and I think there's other things that we have in the works. Um, it's, it's not right off the start, but in the future, um, things like loaning against your, your franchise. So if, if the game starts to get too big for you and you don't have the finances, um, we can offer loans against your, your, your NFT, your, your franchise that you can use to keep playing in the game. And as things grow that your franchise value is going to continue to go up as you know, as more people know about us and more people want to get in. And as we add in more sports and as we add in uh, more minor league sports, like the growth should be there for quite a while. So we do want to bring in investing for sure. Yeah, I, th I think you're onto something there. And, and uh, when I switched my careers, I, I'm not in crypto full time. I switched to education about 11 years ago. And it makes me think you have an excellent platform 
that will be able to teach people about DeFi and about crypto and about blockchain, because there will yes. be perfect examples where you can say, all right, it's just like a ball club. It's just like a football club. It's just right. And these things and to make perfect analogy, well, maybe not perfect, but to make real relatively good analogies between again, something that most of us in the world do and which is partake spectator or otherwise in some particular sport. So I, I think uh, financial literacy um, if enjoy, you know, it's gaming, right? So enjoy within reason. But I think financial literacy could be um, included in as well. You've got me really excited about this this project. Uh, I, I want to make sure I'm not missing something, though. So if if there were a couple of points that, based on our conversation, you would say you didn't feel we talked about enough. What would the first things be that pop into your mind when I, when I bring those opportunities up of like, what did I miss? Well, I think what you just touched on with uh, people not knowing about crypto or actually finance in general, um, 90% of the guys that started with us, the scouts and the franchises knew zero about crypto. And we've probably got 60% of those guys investing in crypto. And because we did, they, they've done very well. And that's, that's a real good feeling. We, we, we opened a lot of eyes. And I think part of Zillica's attraction to us was the fact that we have a way to onboard new people because the sports world, you know, sports people are pretty um, intense and they're focused on sports. They're not focused on blockchain. So right. we're bringing new people in that probably would never look at it or, you know, not for a long time. So that I mean, part, when it comes to sports, we're called fanatics for a reason, right? Yeah. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> and that, like I said, that's one of the things Zilka said is we have an engine for adoption, and that's I I think that's very true. Um, Do you at this time I, or? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to ask: Do you at this time or are looking into the future any formal connections with any particular sport or league? We've already talked to two professional leagues, um, but the thing is their concept of NFTs is what Top Shot did. And it's really hard for, and most of them don't know anything about crypto. So it's going to take some time to get their head around what we're doing. And right. I'm not, we're not in a panic to, to, to get involved with them because I think they're going to come to us because some of the NFT NFT things just aren't sustainable long-term. It'll be like a crypto's kitties thing where, you know, you, you invest a lot of money and then it, it kind of dies off because it's just, it just sits there. Right. And some of the big NFTs will make money, but a lot of people are going to lose money. So I think we'll just have something more sustainable and they'll look towards us once we continue on. <laughs> I'm really impressed with what, um, what you're talking about here, because it's, you know, there, there are, are projects that want to take something that's in the regular world and move it to the blockchain. And that's good. That's very admirable. But then to be able to see the level of possibilities that it's hard for somebody outside of the project for me to see. Yeah. For anybody who's, you know, I, I see people on Twitter and on Telegram who are absolutely rabid already. They're fanatical already about UFFS. And I think some of the things you're saying here will be eye-opening even to them. I hope it is because you're touching on areas that go all the way from advanced AI and machine learning with the, the Legends League. Did I say that? Is it Legends yeah. League? of being able to simulate games based on player stats. That is, you've got modeling and simulation. You have uh, tangibility of the NFT to where it's unique, it's valuable, it stores value, it retains value because of its utility to be able to play in these leagues. You have processing the financial transactions, which what originally, you know, decades ago was just between buddies in somebody's living room that of course has become a multi-billion dollar business now, but um, now looking at that in a more sustainable, consistent, separate from the leagues, if necessary, connected, if, if necessary, I, I think you've given uh, at least me um, a, a lot to think about in terms of two things. One, how impressive of a project this is. So thank you for undertaking you and your team of nine other folks, because um, it seems like you have put a massive amount of thought and effort into it. But also um, what it means for, you know, someone like me who likes the philosophy behind things. Um, it seems like you do as well. And it seems like your team does as well. 
And, you know, the, the side conversations we could go off on is what does it mean that a player is now tokenized? What does it mean that we have their stats and we can pit them against a player? They never, not even in the same lifetime, right? They never overlapped at all. What do those things mean for the future of entertainment? Um, when people talk to me about entertainment NFTs, because I teach in an entertainment program, uh, I, I honestly want to say thank you because I think you're giving me one of the best case studies I could ever stumble across. And so I hope to stay in touch with it and I hope you'll keep me posted. But uh, I know I already asked this question, but I'm going to ask one more time because I'm just so um, floored by the Im uh, impressive amount of work. Um, what should people be knowing? What do you want them hearing as the very last part of this episode directly from you? Um, where should their minds be? What's the thing they need to be left with? I think our important message is that we we're almost taking NFTs to a different level and we're creating NFTs based on real world stats, but they live in an ecosystem where they can attain value and, and they will sustain value. It's a very valuable NFT. The value should never go away. It should only grow because it becomes more rare and, and it can be passed on for generations, to be honest. And it's, it's very important that we create different revenue streams and, and there, there, there's a bunch of revenue streams we haven't even thought of I know for sure so um, and there's multiple ways to get involved you can get involved as a franchise owner which is going to be some big bucks but you can get involved as a GM and, and invest no money just get a wage you can get involved in being a marketing director there's all kinds of ways of being involved and get involved just being a scout which it costs $20 to, to, to register a, a player Unless, unless it's a really valuable player that's already known. Um, you can help find talent, like, especially in a sport like uh, soccer, for example, where they play all over the world in every country. Um, there's no way that every prospect is, is, is scouted, right? So if you know of a local uh, player that's exceptional and it just, you can put him on the blockchain and start start uh, advocating that player, and he might get found and play and play in a <clears throat> in a pro league that he never ever would have. Um, and we're thinking of ways to to help that player along, as in um, making it so that NFT could be sponsored by somebody to help. You know, because some sports are very expensive to, to work your way in. So if you can find unfound talent and, and give them a, a a way up to the top, that's something that our platform can do too. So there's <clears throat> all kinds of ways to be involved. Our project is a 100% DAO, the way it was originally um, planned to be. So we do not own anything other than the tokens. Um, we want the ecosystem to take off on its own. It's like the like Ethereum is, you just add on to it. So how it works is if a new league wants to start up in Europe, in a country that we don't speak the language, we hand it over to somebody and they run that league and a portion of all the revenue from that league goes to that person. And we take nothing from it. Most of the money that we pull in is all going back into development. Um, we not, we're not taking profit from it. We're putting it back into the system. All our goal is to, is to increase the value of the score token. That's our return. I have a little bit to say here, so bear with me. I said you'd be impressed with Tony and UFF Sports and their vision, and I hope you are. The vision is quite detailed and showcases how blockchain technologies aren't some super advanced fix-all for the world and its economic systems, but rather, they're one very, these blockchain tools are one very important tool in the tool chest for continuing the march of human progress. And I'm not being grandiose. We have this issue in the modern world where we don't need everyone's labor. Between technology and automation, I mean, as a species, we're growing lettuce in four-story super high-tech grow houses with very few employees, enough to feed entire populations of countries. And that means it's easier and cheaper to feed people every day. It's easier and cheaper to build and print buildings and houses every day. We're heading towards post-scarcity, and we all know it. Even those of you right now who I'm triggering and you want to rail against that fact and argue it as not a fact and make a point of it, you know it. 
or you wouldn't be buying artificially scarce utility tokens as an investment vehicle. We know that we're at an inflection point, and I've talked to students and businesses for over 10 years about how to prepare for that future and what political and economic changes are necessary. Let's just say I've been called crazy more than once. But to hear Tony lay out how and why some people will be able to quote unquote play at fantasy sports full time, is that any different than the work of sports, which is in fact playing or the play of entertainment or the play of cooking or anything? Did you ever expect a world where playing in a fantasy league would generate market value, stabilize exchanges, and create economic opportunities beyond sports? The 20th century saw the legitimization of music, drama, sports, and others not just as recreational pursuits and some career opportunities for traveling acts. These things became entire industries, strong economic forces all within that century. What happens when blockchain, mixed reality, screenless computing, ambient computing, nanotechnology, and others are all mixed together? You already likely see that Bitcoin as a potential gold reserve to replace silver and gold is fairly good. Why? Because we know we'll soon be obtaining these metals in massive quantities from non-Earth sources, eroding their scarcity. But do you see the larger picture? Do you see the changes happening? Do you see the future? Until next time, I'm Chase Raz, and this is the Zillica Observer.